Nice little remnant prairie just south of Dallas, near the cop shop and a bus station. You can see we're just hanging here. Look at it, you get the limestone all over the ground. And uh, we're here at this little remnant prairie. You can see these dry limestone prairies with our Texas endemic Silphium albiflorum, the white flowered Silphium. It's past flowering. You can see the leaves are starting to die back to that root, that deep tap root that goes uh, quite deep into this uh, this hard limestone soil. Right here, I've got a flower head. And what we're doing today is we're gonna look at collecting seed of this rare plant so some of you out there you know, in a region can uh, come back uh, and get seed and, uh, and grow this. Hopefully plant it in your yard, kill the shit out of your lawn, uh, and uh, plant this instead because it's a Texas endemic and due to the immense amount of development in the region, uh, a lot of the uh, populations of this plant have been wiped out. So it's uh, the population uh, is diminishing. It grows around Austin, Dallas, and uh, just in this, this little central region of Texas. Anyway, uh, as you can see there, we have, those are the seeds. See that black, that phytomelanin, that black pigment right there? These seeds are not, probably not ready yet. They'll probably mature uh, if I were to just, you know, take them inside, put them on a desk. But um, probably better to wait another week or so. But what you do is you come back here. Like here we got a plant right here. Come back. You can see there's the old flower heads. The capitula. All right. Which is uh, specific to the sunflower family. It's a term specific to the sunflower family. Asked Racy. Uh, and you come back. You, you can clip this. Uh, you want to wait until that green material starts to turn kind of a more brown. You want that tissue to die. Once that tissue dies, the seed inside stays alive. And, uh, and then uh, the seed is good. But you want to give that seed as much time as it needs to fully mature. Like I said, these are probably good. But if, uh, you know, if I lived in the region, I'd wait, you know, another, another week, two weeks, maybe even three weeks and come back once the whole thing uh, is uh, finally starting to turn beige. And then uh, out on this, on this species, only the outer, you know, so what you're looking at, this is not a single flower. This is a composite flower. There were many individual flowers. I'll put some up on the screen showing you. All right, so this is a, a you know, probably 40 different tiny flowers inside what looks like a single flower. Only the outer florets are fertile, at least female fertile. So you're only gonna get seed out of those outer florets. You wanna come back, uh, peel these, these bracts off right here, and those little sunflower-like seeds will be inside uh, uh, this, uh, this whole structure right there. So and that's what you want, okay? So uh, give them a mild cold stratification or just sow them directly outside in a pot and, uh, and they'll germinate probably next spring. They might even germinate right away, who knows. But no matter what, with this species, you want to get it in the ground in full sun as soon as possible. It's completely shade intolerant and you cannot grow it in the pot. You wanna put it in the ground. It sends down a deep tap root. It's adapted to these dry, hot limestone prairies of central Texas, okay? So hopefully, uh, now you know how to do that, all right? And they can be very long-lived. I mean, they, they go dormant by about August, and uh, maybe you'll have, you know, one one leaf, maybe two leaves still kind of green, but definitely by September, October, the whole thing will be brown and crispy, and it'll just be alive at the root, and then next, uh, probably April, May, it'll uh, send up another vegetative leaf and then an inflorescence with a big, giant white flower on it. So Silphium albiflorum, really cool Texas endemic, all right? A Texas specialty needs that dry, hot limestone prairie, like you see here, all right? Silphium albiflorum, okay? One of my favorite, one of my favorite composite species that is member of the sunflower family Asteraceae. Look at that, look at these desert snails, Rhabdotus. We get them in the Rio Grande Valley, but I didn't know you had them up here in Dallas too. Quite a few of them, look at that. I love those things. The Coil Tekans used to use those shells as jewelry. Really cool, a desert snail, a drought adapted snail. There you go, there's a good, there's a good illustration. See each one of those, each one of those uh, disc florets, those tiny little dots, uh, is an individual flower and then the only thing that's fertile are these flowers right here along the margins on the outer ring see that you could see those seeds maturing see that only the seeds in the outer outer part are maturing or will turn into fertile seeds rather these are just these are just were just functionally staminate functionally male flowers on the inside see every one of those little black dots corresponds to one flower that's the abscission scar from where the uh, the flower itself fell off so there's, oh, but there, again, there's only ovaries, there's only only uh, single-seeded fruits uh, on the uh, that outer ring. Oh, look at that, look at that, look at that gunk, look at that rosin, all right? That's where the common name for this is rosin weed. What a tough plant. Look, there's a seedling, just two pairs of basil leaves. It's probably only a year or two old, probably two years old. 
Selfie on Alba Florum. Look at this one. See that root? Look at that thick tap root. You gotta, yeah, once you germinate these things, you gotta get them in the ground. Look at that Rhabdotus right there, too. I love, love that cute little bastard, those little desert snails. You gotta get them in the ground as soon as possible. Germinate the seeds, put them right in the ground, keep the competition away, just like you see here, all right? Bare openings. You can let stuff start to encroach once they get big, you know, but you gotta keep it, you still gotta give them space, you know, like six, eight inches space. And I'm sure in a cultivated setting, these things get, you know, they can get huge. You can probably get three or four feet tall, maybe five feet tall in cultivation with more water. Remember, it's really hard out here. It's a lot harder for them out here than it is uh, in cultivation. Look at, what's that, a little dahlia? You get that little hedioma, little mint. Dude, it smells good. The pink tubular flowers. Over here, we got a euploca. Look at this. Just just eroding out of this uh, limestone hill. Baraginaceae. Look at those stiff little hairs appressed to the stem and the leaves. Look at that, that little root. Just like a little wire. Look at that euphorbia corallata. See that? Those tiny white flowers. Can barely see it. The, the, it's such a thin stemmed plant. Really cool prairie member of the rubber and poinsettia family. See with those tiny white flowers. Anyway, here's a wonderful specimen of that Sophia mabiflorum. Look at all those flower heads maturing. I'd say you still got two weeks to a month to go. I pulled one of these things off to dissect it and show you what's going on. You could see all the seeds only on the outer ring. Look, you could each one of those abscission scars down those little those little black dots is an abscission scar. So you can see all that. Each one of those corresponds to one flower. These right here, the central disc flowers, uh, were, again were just functionally staminate. They were just functionally male. I ripped those out to show you the uh, the akines, the single seeded fruit, because a sunflower seed is technically a fruit. It's a single seeded fruit. But there you go. Just, just looking like a sunflower seed with uh, with kind of like wings on them. See that? Probably for, you know, wind dispersal. Okay, in case you get a harsh wind, it'll take it a few feet from the plant, from the mother plant. But that's what you're looking for, and that's what uh, that's what you want to harvest, all right? The, the ideal thing to do, of course, is grow a few of these, get them in the ground, and then use them as stock plants in your yard so you can get more seed off of them and begin to repopulate the species, all right? It's not just a pipe dream, all right? The Anthropocene has been kind of depressing, it's true, but you know, you could do your little part, recreate some of the native habitat that used to be where you live in your front yard. Bring back the prairie, look at all that shit, what is that? What's all that invasive shit over there? Is that all privet? Oh God, it is, it's, it's all privet. Oh God, it sucks. Non-native to North America. And you could tell by the way it behaves. It's got nothing to keep it in check, it just takes off and forms the thicket. Oh, look at that. Look at that Sylphium abiflorum over there, growing at the edge of that uh, juniper. Ah, uh, you get a couple people out here, you know, just a couple volunteer hours a week, you could clear a lot of this stuff, bring back the native habitat. But, uh, you know, not a lot of people give a shit. At the moment, hopefully that changes. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I would look at it on a satellite map. This is all open and clear, but now it's all filled in with privet. I don't know when that satellite image that I was looking at was taken, but apparently it was quite some time ago because this is impenetrable now that's all invasive bullshit that's all invasive privet and there was probably a lot of uh sylphium aviflorum there only a few years ago but there's no way it's there now it can't take shade so it's all choked out sylphium aviflorum everybody sylphium aviflorum there you go look you can see it's not even growing it really needs these bare exposures it's not even growing up there probably because the seeds can't get established anyway i'd really hate to see this thing not be around anymore you know it's already so many populations have been knocked out and developed uh, to build things like data centers or warehouses or suburbs etc it really loves loves this kind of uh, dry limestone stuff but you know like many of these plants it'll do fine uh, in a front yard in full sun so kill your lawn plant some of the cool texas prairie natives that's all i got go fuck yourself bye The most obnoxious insect in the world. God, I love it. Quesada gigas.